Here we're going to derive some integral identities for the Riemann zeta function. And really, we're just going to look at the Riemann zeta function evaluated at positive integers, but this technique can be easily extended. So let's first recall that the Riemann zeta function evaluated at m is the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of 1 over n plus 1 to the m. So I've re-indexed that a little bit just to make the calculations work a little bit better. And I want to point out that as we build these integral identities, this is somewhat of a roadmap for building all integral identities. So as you'll see, we'll start with a couple of facts and then we'll just keep layering substitutions over substitutions until we come up with some surprise surprising identities. Okay, so we're going to take two things as facts and then we're going to prove one little lemma as a tool just in case you haven't seen it before. So the first thing that we're going to take as a fact is the sum of a geometric series. So let's recall for u on the open interval from minus 1 to 1, we have 1 over 1 minus u is the same thing as the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of u to the n. Okay, and then also we have the definition of the Laplace transform of a function. Now there are some rules that this function has to follow, but I'll let you guys look that up if you want to. So the Laplace transform of f of t is equal to the integral from zero to infinity of f of t times e to the minus st dt. And now this is a function of s. So the transformed function is a function of s. Okay, and this tool that we're going to use, which we will prove by induction, is that the Laplace transform of t to the k, where k is a natural number, is k factorial over s to the k plus 1. Okay, so let's maybe go ahead and check this first. So let's look at our base case. And I'll take our base case to be k equals 0, just so that it's really simple. So that means we want to look at the Laplace transform of t to the 0, but that's just the Laplace transform of the constant function 1. So that's going to be equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of 1 times e to the minus st dt, like that. Now, next what we can do is just take the antiderivative and plug in the bounds. Well, the upper bound will have to use a limit, but we'll kind of gloss over that because it's pretty straightforward what happens here. Um, again, we're using fundamental theorem of calculus. So this is going to give us minus 1 over s e to the minus st evaluated from 0 to infinity. And I should point out that this evaluation at infinity, like I said, is really the limit as t is approaching infinity. So notice as t approaches infinity, e to the minus st approaches 0. And then as t equals 0, e to the minus st is equal to 1. But that's our lower bound, so it switches this sign. That gives us 1 over s. So we have established this identity for k equals 0. Now let's make our induction hypothesis. So we'll suppose for some l bigger than or equal to 0, we have the Laplace transform of t to the l is equal to l factorial over s to the l plus 1. Now we want to consider the next case. So let's do that. So let's consider the Laplace transform of t to the l plus 1 and see what we get. Okay, so by definition, that's going to be the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the l plus 1 times e to the minus st dt, like that. Okay, nice. Now, that's a polynomial times an exponential function. So what we probably want to do is use integration by parts. That's the standard strat strategy for a polynomial times a transcendental function. In this case, like I said, an exponential function. So let's get our setup for integration by parts. We'll set u equal to t to the l plus 1. So you generally want to set, set u equal to the thing that becomes simpler under differentiation. In this case, the polynomial. Now taking the derivative, that tells us du is equal to l plus 1 t to the l dt, like that. Now next we can set dv equal to the rest of it, so that's going to be e to the minus st dt, but that makes v equal minus 1 over s e to the minus st, like that, just by anti-differentiation. But now applying the integration by parts formula, we have u times v evaluated at the end points, so that's going to give us minus t to the l plus 1 over s e to the minus st evaluated from t equals 0 to t approaching infinity. 
then we'll have minus the integral of v du. Okay, so notice the minus sign built into integration by parts and minus sign built into v will cancel. And then with respect to the integral, s is a constant and l plus one is a constant. So we can just pull those out, leaving us with l plus one over s times the integral from zero to infinity of t to the l e to the minus st. And now it's becoming clear maybe what's going on here. Now as t approaches infinity, this exponential term will dominate this polynomial term and so it'll cancel out to zero. You can see that by repeated applications of L'Hopital's rule. Maybe you could prove that by induction two if you really wanted to. Next, if you evaluate this at t equals zero, the exponential thing is the number one, and this is zero, so that cancels out as well, meaning that this whole thing right here just gives us the number zero. Next, we see that the integral that's left over after one step of integration by parts is in fact the Laplace transform from our induction hypothesis. So this is the Laplace transform of t to the l. Now we can plug in our induction hypothesis to give us l plus one times l factorial, but that's exactly l plus one factorial, over s times s to the l plus one, but that's gonna give us s to the l plus two. But starting over here at the extreme left hand to right hand side of the equation, we see that that's exactly what we needed to do to prove this induction step, which establishes this formula. Now we're ready to move on to developing an integral identity for this Riemann zeta function. Okay, so first off what I wanna do is notice that this object inside of the sum looks like a multiple of this Laplace transform of t to the k. In fact, we can rewrite this as the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of one over m minus one factorial, and then the Laplace transform of t to the m minus one, where we've evaluated that at s equals n plus one. So let's maybe talk our way through that. Notice if we take the Laplace transform of t to the m minus one, we'll get m minus one factorial and then s to the m. Next, we wanna evaluate that here and we get n plus one to the m in the denominator and then the factorial that we got from the Laplace transform and the factorial that we multiplied in will cancel each other so we get back to what we started at. So that's good news. Okay, nice. Now what we'll do is replace this Laplace transform with its definition so that's going to give us this sum as n goes from zero up to infinity of one over m minus one factorial. And now we'll have the integral from zero to infinity of t to the m minus one e to the minus st, but we've evaluated s at n plus one. So this is going to be minus n plus one t dt like that. Next, what we can do is maybe notice that this e to the minus n plus one t can be rewritten a little bit. In fact, it can be rewritten as e to the minus t times e to the minus t all to the n power. That might seem a little bit overkill, but rewriting it as e to the minus t to the n power will allow us to use this guy right here, this sum of a geometric series. Okay, so let's maybe clean this up a little bit and bring this sum in so that only this e to the minus t to the n power is within the sum. Okay, so that's gonna give us one over m minus one factorial, and then we'll have the integral from zero to infinity of t to the m minus one. We'll have an e to the minus t, and then finally here we'll have this sum as n goes from zero up to infinity of e to the minus t all to the n power dt, like that. Next we can apply our sum of a geometric series formula like we alluded to, to rewrite this term as one over one minus e to the minus t, like that. Okay, so let's see what that leaves us with. That leaves us with one over m minus one factorial. And now we've got the integral from zero to infinity of, 
let's see. In the numerator, we have t to the m minus 1, e to the minus t. And in the denominator, we have 1 minus e to the minus t dt. So there, we've already got kind of a satisfying integral identity for the Riemann zeta function already. Now we could tweak this a little bit to get another fairly interesting integral identity. Maybe we could multiply the numerator and the denominator by e to the t, and that's going to give us 1 over m minus 1 factorial, and then the integral from 0 to infinity, multiplying by e to the t, will cancel this one out in the numerator, and then switch up the denominator a little bit to give us t to the m minus 1 over e to the t minus 1 dt. And I think if you look up in Wikipedia or just like a standard reference, this is like maybe the most well-known integral identity for the Riemann zeta function. Okay, but I want to focus on this one and see what we can get out of this guy right here. So let's maybe go ahead and bring that up and then tweak this a little bit to derive some more identities. So on the last board, we arrived at the following fairly interesting identity for the Riemann zeta function. Now we want to tweak this a little bit to maybe find some more identities. So I'm looking at this and seeing that the denominator is quite complicated. So perhaps we could do a substitution that would simplify that denominator. So let's say our substitution wants to do something like this, x equals 1 minus e to the minus t. So what would t have to be in order for that to work out? Well, let's check. So that means 1 minus x equals e to the minus t. So how did we get that? Well, we just kind of moved some things around. That's pretty clear. Now we can take the natural log of both sides and see that minus t is equal to the natural log of 1 minus x. In other words, t is equal to minus natural log of 1 minus x, like that. OK, well, that's pretty nice. Let's see what kind of simplification that will give us. Well, we'll need to calculate the dt component. So our dt component will be 1 over 1 minus x, like that. OK, and while we're at it, since we've got this free e to the minus t here, let's maybe go ahead and underline this part because we're going to need that as well. OK, so here we're going to have 1 over m minus 1 factorial. The integral, we'll have to talk about the bounds of integration, but we haven't done that yet. Notice that t to the m minus 1 will now be equal to minus natural log of 1 minus x all to the m minus 1 power, like that. Okay, and then notice our denominator is simply x, so that's pretty nice. And then our e to the minus t and our dt will cancel out those extra terms. Notice our e to the minus t has a 1 minus x, our dt has a 1 over 1 minus x. So that's just going to give us a dx here, like that. Now let's talk about the bounds of integration. So when t is equal to 0, x is also equal to 0. That's clear from this equation right here. So our lower bound stays at 0. Now as x approaches infinity, t is going to be approaching 1. Now as t approaches infinity, e to the minus t approaches 0, which means x is approaching 1. So that becomes our upper bound of integration. OK, so I think this is a nice identity as well. Maybe we could um, rewrite it a little bit to make it a little nicer. We could bring this minus 1 to the m minus 1 out front, leaving us with minus 1 to the m minus 1 over m minus 1 factorial, and then the integral from 0 to 1 of natural log of 1 minus x to the m minus 1 over x dx. So now we've got another nice integral identity for the Riemann zeta function. OK, let's bring that up and let's maybe derive one more identity. So let's maybe build one more identity. So looking at this one, we see that it's kind of nice. But maybe we could simplify what's going on within the natural log. We've got a 1 minus x inside of the natural log. Maybe we could simplify that down to one term. And I think we could probably do that with some sort of trigonometric substitution. In fact, what if we let x equal sine squared theta? So if x is equal to sine squared theta, we've got 1 minus x inside of natural log, but that makes 1 minus x 1 minus sine squared theta, which is equal to cosine squared theta. So that's pretty nice. Now let's see what our dx component is. 
So here we're going to have to use the chain rule. So that's gonna give us two times sine theta times cosine theta d theta. Okay, so that's what's happening with our variables. What about our bounds of integration? Okay, so when x is equal to zero, that means sine squared is equal to zero, which tells us that theta could be equal to zero. Then when x is equal to one, sine squared is going to be equal to one, but we can take theta to be equal to pi halves. So we'll have theta equal pi over two, and that's because sine of pi over two is one. Okay, so let's see what that gives us. So we're gonna have this minus one to the m minus one out front, m minus one factorial in the denominator down there. And now we'll have the integral from zero to pi halves of the natural log to the m minus one of cos squared theta. Again, that's from our argument right here. And then we've got this dx component well, what's gonna go on with that dx component? We have two sine cosine d theta, but we also have a sine squared in the denominator. So the sine in the numerator from the dx will cancel with one of the signs in the denominator, leaving us with just cosine theta d theta over sine theta, and then we need to pick up a multiple of two, which maybe I'll put right there. So let's see, maybe we could rewrite this a little bit to make it look better. Maybe we could take this cosine squared and take the two out front, but notice it needs to be raised to the m minus one power because it's inside a natural log to the m minus one. So let's see what that's gonna leave us with. We're gonna have minus one to the m minus one times two times two to the m minus one that's by using our log rule here. This is gonna be all over m minus one factorial. And then we're gonna be left with the integral from zero to pi halves of the natural log to the m minus one of cosine theta. And then cosine over sine is cotangent, but that's one over tangent. So maybe to make it look a little bit more balanced, we'll write this as over tangent theta d theta. Okay, maybe we could simplify this out just a little bit more by pulling this two to the m minus one inside of this minus one to the m minus one. So that's gonna give us two times minus two to the m minus one over m minus one factorial, the integral from zero to pi halves of natural log to the m minus one cos theta d theta, that's all over tangent theta. And there, we've got another surprising identity for the Riemann zeta function. Okay, so maybe if you guys wanna play this game some more, see what you can come up with and post in the comments. And that's a good place to stop.